Welcome, my name is Dave Heischel. I'm the President and CEO of Eagle Technologies. Uh, today we are presenting on how to protect SaaS solutions as well as endpoint solutions. We have a couple of guest speakers today. Uh, Don Foster from Commvault. I've worked with Don for many, many years. Uh, he's taken on uh, several different roles within Commvault and has always been a big advocate and evangelist for, uh, for data protection and data management. We also have Ryan Sinwell, a longtime customer and, and somebody I'm proud to call a friend as well. He's been a customer of, of Eagle Technologies for, I'm gonna have to let Ryan answer that question later. I'm guessing 10 plus years um, or, or very close to that anyway. Um, and he's uh, presented at Commvault Ghost. We're happy to have him on as well. Patrick Mann is going to be helping on the, the panelist section at the end. So if we have some questions, feel free to, to chat those in. We have quite a few people on this call, so we probably won't open the, um, the, the voice lines up. So if you have questions, um, please uh, get those in as, as they come, come up and we will get those answered throughout the presentation. And again, we'll have a little bit of a panelist uh, session at the end. So with that, let's uh, let's kick it off and get started here. So we had this conversation a while back, uh, and we we tried to figure out why people wanted to work with Eagle Technologies. We're a small little bar out of the Midwest, and uh, we've been around for many many years. And it really came down to the fact that uh, a lot of people do have that trust in what we're offering. They understand the process, and we'll get into that in a minute. And, and we we kind of revised our our mission statement a little bit to really build that customer trust and the and the way we do that is is through successful outcomes so you know a mission is to earn customer trust and build lasting relationships through successful outcomes really ties it all together for us from our standpoint it's really not the widgets that we sell so much it it's the process around how we how we offer those widgets and uh, how we interact with our customers. It's made us very successful over the years. So we really do appreciate that. Um, a lot of that process we talked about is, is a lot of upfront legwork that we do for you. The due diligence, if you will, the research um, that we offer into the product uh, before we even offer it to you as a customer. Many times we are a consumer of that product. Most of the things that we sell today we actually use in our data center or our cloud offerings as well. We do a good job. We've been in the industry a long time. Um, I, well, I've been in the industry, but uh, at this point, we've, we've really learned to get through the hype, understand what's real and what is just marketing. Um, marketing is a great way to get information out there, but we have, to, we have to get through the noise to understand how it applies to folks' needs, their business needs, how it uh, you know, improves their business, how it helps the IT staff, how it mitigates risk, how it builds revenue, all of those things come into play. And we really think we do a good job of understanding some of these new up and coming solutions, how they're gonna fare way before uh, most people do in the marketplace today. Um, and then we tend to pick best of breed out of that. You know, we don't offer everything. Our portfolio is less than a dozen products that we mainly sell um, in different categories, obviously. And we, we really pride ourselves in staying current with those. And that's, that's really a foundation of why we offer Commvault today, for sure, as just one of those. So the process. Uh, the first thing we do when we engage with someone that's uh, an end user or a customer is we listen to what that project is, what that need is, what those pain points are. You really can't just go in with the idea that we're gonna sell widget A, right? You have to understand what the needs are. The, the next piece of it is, okay, I, I think we have a solution here, but let's educate that end user and agree that that solution's a good fit. That's very, very key to understanding uh, or to building that relationship that we talked about earlier, is if, if I have a solution that I think is, is right we need to educate you as to how that fits into your business need at that point um, and then folks like patrick take over patrick is a great solutions architect we have several of those guys on staff and they can really put all the pieces of the puzzle together and make it a solution our goal is to build a good blueprint you may not choose to purchase all the pieces on that blueprint right off the bat 
but at least let's follow that blueprint so that we, we have a, a, a great solution at the end of the day. It was interesting if you pull a lot of IT managers and if they looked in their data center of all the different pieces and parts, would you build it that way today if you could start from scratch? And most people would answer that question, no, right? There, there's better solutions out there or I had to buy a stopgap solution that no longer fits. We pride ourselves with most of our customers that not being the case, which is, uh, which is uh, a, a great outcome if you, if, if you ask me. The other piece of it, you know, we deploy the solutions out there. We train the customers on how to use that so that they get the best ROI out of it. Uh, and then second to none, I'm really proud of our support staff for supporting that solution after the fact. In the Commvault world, we were basically the architects of their, uh, what they call today a CAS program, which basically enables resellers like us to support them as a level one support center. We were doing that way before it was a program. They literally had in their price book for a while, Eagle level one support. Um, and then they formalized that to allow other partners to do it. Um, so we're very proud of that achievement and, and we continue to do that. And today I think we're still only one of two or three in the United States that do that. It's more, I will let you take it away, Don. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. And actually, yeah, I mean, even, even before in product management, I remember when you're in the field as, as SEs and we've been, a, it's been a fantastic partnership for probably like, I think at least 15 years now that I've known, uh, known you and, and your team and, yep. um, you know, love what you guys do with, with your, your process and how you help customers. You've been a fantastic partner for us and, uh, here's to continuing that partnership, right? Yep. Absolutely. I appreciate it. So yeah, no problem. So my, my name is Don Foster. I'm the VP of storage solutions for Commvault. Um, and essentially I've been in a number of different roles, uh, and, uh, been helping with a, a number of some of our technology acquisitions and some of the integration components that we do, uh, as we continue to deliver call world-class data management, uh, solutions for our customers. Uh, but, um, you know, Dave mentioned the, uh, the offer on endpoints and that's really what we wanted to touch on today is just, you know, how do you protect and secure that remote user data? Uh, because in today's new reality, it's definitely uh, it's definitely a different world as far as you know, remote devices, bring your own devices, et cetera. And uh, it's probably no surprise to anyone here if you've been paying attention to the news. Um, the threat of ransomware, I and mean, it's become an economy, it's become a business, um, uh, unfortunately, in which malware, ransomware, uh, and these types of attacks are, you know, are absolutely uh, having uh, economic viability because people pay the fine. And it's interesting because from a couple of our different uh, research that we've done from the Pundle Institute, 68% of IT security professionals say that uh, they've experienced an attack. So uh, if you take a look at the you know 70 plus attendees that we have here, that means more than half of us on this call have probably seen some form of attack. And typically when this happens, um, the, the, uh, the time and the costs are real, right? So up to this point going into 2019, We've essentially seen in the U.S. about a $7.5 billion impact from those ransomware attacks. And you may or may not know this, but on average, it's a 14 hour, uh, 14 hour average of downtime from a single event. And, uh, you know, that event could be on a remote device. It could be in the cloud. Uh, it's even happened against some SaaS applications. So, you know, the threats are real. They are costly. And, you know, the question is, is it going to be getting any better for us all? And I think with the new normal that we're seeing with remote workforces uh, and with the, uh, you know, the actual sort of business that the, unfortunately that the uh, malware and cyber attacks are driving, it's probably just going to continue to accelerate, which means we have to be ever more vigilant on how we define not only what our security uh, perimeters look like for how we ensure, you know, solid data center control, how we're moving to the cloud, how we're ensuring data in transmission is being, is being secured and encrypted. Um, but more importantly, realize that, uh, you know, this just focusing on Windows or whatnot is, uh, you know, absolutely um, going to change. And as you see here, I've moved the poll out of, uh, out of my screen view here. Um, the uh, IT security group guru is predicting that ransomware attacks against Linux operating systems and more importantly, Mac are, are, are increasing and that it will continue to increase because in many cases, it's not just about the operating system any longer, um, you know, for being, you know, potential, having potential security loopholes. And as more and more end users 
move towards Mac and other Linux-based variants from, a, from an operating system perspective, it again just helps drive that economy for the malware and ransomware to be focusing on those types of, of, of endpoints. So today's workforce trends also bring this more to the, uh, to the forefront. Um, I have a picture here of, uh, of uh, some of the, uh, my colleagues on a Zoom call. Uh, and I think we're all kind of used to doing this now from a remote work perspective. And it's definitely changed the way that we think about where our data is being stored, whether or not company data assets are being protected, um, you know, how do you handle certain things like a hard drive failing on a laptop, um, how do you ensure security is being done properly? Uh, what, if, uh, what if end users are still bringing their own devices? Like I can tell you right here on my desk, I have my company issued device and I have my desktop that I built myself. I use both for work. How do we ensure that that data is secure on both sides? And more importantly, you know, does my company know what I'm doing on my own home network? Am I using a VPN here? Are all of our users doing that? The new variables to the remote workforce are many. Um, and it can be somewhat concerning to ensure that your company data is properly secured and more importantly, that you can properly respond in case something happens. It could be a hard drive failure. It could be a malware attack. It could be a virus attack. Um, with everyone dialing in through VPNs, it makes that sort of uh, risk that much greater. And so we really need to start thinking about, if you haven't already, how do we protect these endpoints? How do we ensure that our company data that we know is getting pushed more and more out to the edge? How do we ensure that we can not only allow our end users to be as efficient as possible and more at the same time, ensure that we have, or we are giving them the level of security, the level of protection, the level of, uh, of availability for their information and data, that if there are outages, that there are problems, that that 14 hour average uh, that we see when attacks occur can get, can get reduced down. And that's where Commvault comes into play with what we can do from an endpoint data protection perspective. Obviously everyone knows that with Commvault Complete Back and Recovery, we have one of the industry's most robust products. And of course, when we think about endpoints, this product has the capabilities that help meet what we see are the three main needs, securing that endpoint data, giving the visibility into that data as it's been secured, and of course, making sure the entire operation from the beginning to end is as automated as possible so that us as the end users never see the impact of how that data is being protected and that happens under the cover. So it's important to make sure we can handle all three of these different needs. On the securing and endpoint data side, it's all about helping to mitigate your risk, making sure that that data is protected, the data is, is, is understood, and that if there's any sort of data breach, if there's any sort of you know, lost device, broken device, I'm not so sure stolen devices are going to be quite as much of a, uh, a, of a risk at this point, being that we don't travel as much, um, but ensuring that that data is available, uh, and even if an employee departs the company, it's having that data uh, controlled, protected, secured, so that the business has control of their data assets and that they don't have to worry about it walking away uh, with any sort of data breach or any sort of uh, device issue. The visibility piece then allows you to ensure that you understand where your intellectual property lies. So it's protected, it's controlled, it's secured perhaps in your data center, maybe it's secured in the cloud, maybe it's secured in, in, in a couple of different ways, uh, but having the visibility to know what's protected, what lives inside of that data, so that if anything happens from an e-discovery perspective all the way through to just tracking your uh, uh, sort of your, your, your risk footprint, you have visibility into what data is there. And of course, finally, the actual process of securing that data, the protection, needs to be as automated as possible. And so you want to em empower your employees to not have to worry about if the data is protected, but empower them to be able to do their own restores in case things go sideways i.e. If, if this PowerPoint gets corrupted, I'd like to be able to get the, the version that I was working on maybe two hours ago. Uh, those types of things can become very important depending on what you're working on and ensuring that I don't have to pick up the phone and burden my help desk just to restore a, a version of a file or to get access to a file that perhaps is no longer available because of corruption, deletion, user error, you name it. So these are all the key needs from, a, uh, from an endpoint perspective. And of course, from Commvault's perspective, when we look at how we try to em employ these, we realize that there's really about five main requirements um, that we can help to drive uh, those specific needs. And that's obviously the silent protection of that laptop and, and desktop data. It's ensuring that data is secure with all the different things that you would think about for how you would respond if, uh, if things happen to go sideways from you know, erasing data, restoring data, remote wipe, et cetera, having those capabilities built into the, into the solution. 
giving you and your administrators all the visibility into the actual company data asset with the ability to, to assign rights and roles to who has access to what and where inside of the company. Being able to even do some simple file sharing so that we're still not sending e large email attachments, uh, you know, whether it's done through, uh, through Commvault file sharing, whether it's done through OneDrive, just giving another option for how that file sharing can be very secure. And of course, like I say, self-service, making sure that we, the end users, can do the work, so that we don't have to burden our, our IT staff on, uh, on you know, providing that solution and answering questions and doing self-service restores, et cetera. So the way we look at this is that we should be able to provide this level of protection as a whole solution and make this as simple as possible for the end users, but also for yourself as well in administering, installing, and managing this across the, the new normal of our enterprise. And the way we do that, and we're gonna kind of double click into each one of these, is ensuring that the, this, this sort of complete solution is available to you as a part of what we have within Combo Complete Back Recovery. Every time that poll pops up, I lose the, uh, the focus on the screen and my slide movers don't work. There we go. So how do we do all this? You know, what are, what are the key components of how we, we handle these, these uh, five requirements that we basically drive the core needs of endpoint protection? Well, number one, we have within our platform, uh, whether you're a Commvault customer or not today, um, we have within our platform the ability to truly securely and efficiently protect that endpoint data. Um, the ability for deduplication on the client side, across the network, across the internet, across VPNs, into the cloud, however it is that you're communicating, First and foremost, that is built into the platform to ensure that you don't need massive amounts of bandwidth. And as we move that data, we also can ensure that it's encrypted at FIPS level standards, which is Department of Defense or NIST uh, certified encryption ciphers, to make sure that your data is secure and known about only by you and your company and not opening you up to potential risks for you know, anything that might be trying to sniff the data across the wire, across the VPN, or even if perhaps someone has access to the information where you've landed it. So that's all super important to know that that data is completely secure from the point that we pick it up, move it, deduplicate it, and store it all in line. Uh, and of course, we can also ensure that once that data is stored, that we can prevent any sort of authorized, unauthorized access to those backup files, to the files that have been stored, uh, and ensuring that no one but Commvault and the administrators and the folks that you have defined within your security parameters within Commvault have the access to do the resource, to browse the files, et cetera. So you don't have to worry about ransomware potentially striking in your data center or in your cloud and potentially encrypting all of that data and making it unusable. And of course, as you think about that deduplication, um, it's also all about automatic scheduling and the throttling of backup execution. And these are really interesting points because when you think about it, you know, some days there might be a small amount of data that changes. Other days, we might be going through a number of different files depending upon our line of work and see a lot of changes occur uh, on your remote devices. And so because of this, Commvault has developed the automatic scheduling component in which we're tracking the changes that are occurring on the laptops. And only when it hits a certain point do we decide that we're going to, um, are we going to do, do we decide that we're going to run a backup? Meaning we, we're not going to wait until you have gigs and gigs and gigs of data and running that schedule once a night, but instead maybe executing this five or six times throughout the day to ensure that we're moving small pieces of data across the wire. Uh, versus trying to move an entire massive data workload over and over again. And then, of course, as we do that, ensuring that we're throttling how much bandwidth, how much CPU, how much processing power and resource that we're actually taking on that device as we run those jobs. Ensuring then that a backup might be running and you won't even know it as an end user. All very important things when it comes to scaling this across a multitude of users. And of course, we talked a little bit about security. But from an encryption perspective, we ensure the data is encrypted at transit at rest. Um, we can do selective encryption of the client side files and folders as well. So it's just another level of security if it's something that you require on specific file sets. Um, we have the ability to do geolocation and to mitigate the risk of, the, of any stolen endpoints. In fact, uh, an interesting story, one of a, one Combine employee at one point had a, a MacBook Pro that got stolen. And uh, believe it or not, it was stolen and, and we were able to track to where it was stolen and where it was powered on and utilized. Uh, and uh, we were actually able to get the laptop back, um, no questions asked, because of some of that geolocation of what occurred within that remote device. So it gives you an ability to understand where your devices are. 
It also gives him the ability to do any of the selective erase of data or the entire endpoint. So if it does get stolen and you can't get the data back and you know there's some form of risk of the data that's on it, the remote wipe ensures that any of the information that might be uh, key company materials is stricken from the device. And of course, remember, with the way Commodore is set up and the way our platform works, things like air gaps are very easy to put in play to ensure that none of the data in the back end can get corrupted. So you're efficiently moving data, you're getting things protected without impacting that end user, which is paramount. We're ensuring that things are secure, both at rest and going across the wire. And of course, once we have this information collected, then it becomes that much easier for you to start to use that data. Whether it's from an e-discovery perspective, whether it's trying to track company data or seeing if, if data is being utilized or, or, or maybe pulled from, from uh, uh, corporate storage locations and being put on endpoints that might add to risk, you can start tracking that sort of, sort of concern and that sort of, uh, uh, sort of risk by tracking what files are being stored where, uh, having a chance to un understand and view the sensitive data that might live within these devices, seeing if things uh, are, are properly encrypted or not. And of course, giving the ability for full context-based search across all endpoints for whatever that, that use case might be from a security pers uh, perspective, maybe it's legally discovery, maybe it's a, uh, an HR issue. All of these things are available for quick and first pass review. And of course, when you need to get access to data as an admin, you'll be able to actually export all that information in its native format and provide it to the users that require it. So it's collected, it's secure, you're able to then get access to it. And then as an end user, you also have the ability to do some secure file sharing, meaning you can use web links to where that data is stored within our backend repository and transfer and share and provide access to another user uh, by using those secure web links. And of course, ensuring that all access controls are tied into things like Active Directory uh, or whatever your, uh, your, your all up protocol might be uh, and, and ensure that um, you've got complete audits audit uh, transparency of who's accessing what files, how it's being shared, and how it's being controlled. So it's just a nice to have for making it easier to share these files without passing everything through email. And then of course, finally, having that simplified self-service control, whether it's for files, folders, entire resources, or whether it's just trying to see where a device is, if it's been lost, you can log into your own portal view from Commvault um, through, the, through the command center or through your own uh, sort of remote edge device uh, uh, portal and do all the necessary restores that are required from a single file to viewing all versions to running a backup if you've just done some things that are really important that you want to ensure at that point in time it gets protected. It's all self-service control and of course tying in all these key, uh, all these key uh, um, capabilities and features to make this as simplified as possible. So for endpoints with our new normal, we really do have sort of that right solution to the job. We're taking the idea of this enterprise capability that you're thinking about for your VMs, for your data centers, for your remote sites, for your cloud, uh, for your cloud uh, workloads, and we're applying that technology in a specific way for endpoints to ensure that it's protected, that it's secure, that you've got the visibility in it, into the data, and that you can do some interesting self-service things, whether it's recovering only what you need or sharing files with other, other coworkers or people outside your organization. All of that is built in. Now, you're probably thinking, awesome, this is probably something we should start on. But uh, I'm not sure if I have the infrastructure or if I'm ready to kind of yeah, what it takes to kind of get this implemented. You know, how, how can I get started quickly without adding infrastructure uh, or adding to my current Commvault environment? And Dave mentioned a current uh, um, offer that we have. And we'll probably go deeper into this later in, in, in the webinar. But uh, you may not know that Commvault launched a software as a service uh, venture called Metallic which brings all of the powerful enterprise-grade data solutions that Commvault has um, and delivers them as a SaaS solution. Um, and that gives you the power to grow. It gives you the power to quickly implement these sort of solutions. And with that offer, um, Metallic has endpoint backup recovery, which allows us as a SaaS solution to quickly deploy endpoint backup across all of your endpoints, across your new new wall, and to ensure that that data is protected, it's secured, that you have access and visibility to it, you can give that self-service requirement to, to the end user as necessary, and we can manage it completely as a SaaS solution. So this is available today within Commvault Metallic. Uh, Eagle can help you get started. So if it's something you're interested in and you want to take a look at the, at the offer, um, I believe it's a, a, a free number of endpoint devices that you can have protected today, starting with SaaS uh, through Metallic. Give them a quick call. And it, it's not limited just to endpoint back in recovery, although we're focusing on that here. 
If you also have Office 365 or Microsoft 365 solutions, um, even if you've got virtual machines and cloud virtual machines, et cetera, we can help tie into those from a SaaS perspective as well as you're thinking about your new remote, your new remote workforce and your new remote data center. So I hope this was interesting. Um, interested to kind of dig into more of the details and, and kind of the Q and A and panel conversation as we go here. But I think before we get into that, I am going to uh, pass the ball over to one of our Commvaults. I would say longtime customers, probably ten plus years. I think Ryan. Uh, I think Dave also mentioned you presented at one of our Commvault goes. I think it was two years ago, or maybe it was the inaugural one. I can't quite remember. Maybe it was both. Um, but you've been a fantastic customer, and uh, I know you've got a great story to tell about White. Um, and your role there as an infrastructure manager and how Commvault has helped, uh, I think, also in the SaaS and Salesforce arena as well. So I will pass it over to you. So, yeah, as as uh, Don mentioned, I've, we've been a Commvault customer actually since we met Eagle back in 2006. So Dave was uh, close or about 14-year customer of, 14 of both companies. So, um, so I'm Ryan Sinwell, Senior IT Manager of Infrastructure at the White's Company. And... Well, it's company is a, a construction company, but at heart, we're the oldest AEC firm west of the Mississippi, sixth oldest construction company in the U.S. So we've been around quite a while, founded in Des Moines, Iowa in 1855. Um, I've been working at White's for 19 years and have kind of seen our technology grow up all through the, all through the different phases we've been in, a lot of the consolidation that helped bring in Commvault. Um, despite what my younger employees think I'm not the oldest IT manager west of the Mississippi. Um, but I started at White's in 2001 as an intern in computer and I was a computer engineer intern when I finished that, started full time with White's, kind of climbed up through service desk and what we now call service desk back then it was just the IT grunt. Um, and now I run our infrastructure group and our service desk rolls up through me. So to give you an idea of the kind of projects White's builds, you might recognize some of the buildings that are on this slide. Uh, the new Kansas City Airport is a big one that I know everybody in the KC area is really excited to see going. We're a joint venture partner on that. If you end up taking a trip to Honolulu, our second photo there is the new uh, rental car facility that's at the Honolulu International Airport. Uh, desperately needed in that area. It's a tight space and, and a lot of rental cars going in and out of there. Uh, big partner with Iowa State University, lots of work at their at their uh, stadium there. Cabela's is a well-known name. This one's in La Vista, uh, Nebraska, right near Omaha. Um, number five is actually an interesting one. It's the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Walmart headquarters. And when we built it in 2010, it was the largest lead platinum uh, corporate, off corporate building in the, in the world. Um, leads all about sustainability and green building practices and it's, it's really common for building owners to seek that these days and one of the things we pride ourselves on being really good at. Uh, number six is just one of many uh, multifamily apartment style buildings that we build across the U.S. There's a lot of really high-end things going in Denver these days. This one happens to be in Phoenix and if you recognize number seven it's a building that's known as Fox Plaza out in California but if you're a fan of the movie Die Hard, you probably know this building is Nakatomi Plaza. So we were actually building this in the mid to late 80s. Uh, they were filming Die Hard and Fox came to, came to us and said, hey, we need a building that we can rig to explode for the, for the big scenes in this movie. And we were able to make that work out for them while we were still under construction of their new headquarters. So um, I like to refer to Whites as a cloud lean, leaning company rather than cloud first. A lot of people are talking about cloud first for everything, but in my mind, when we're looking for a new solution, we look for something that's cloud capable or in the cloud where possible, um, rather than trying to bring something in house that, that I need specialized engineers to run, care and feed for. Um, if we can get an expert to do that in the cloud for us, we're, we're definitely leaning that way. So I, I go with cloud leaning there. So examples of that, we use Box for document collaboration, Office 365, Salesforce. Um, one of our biggest applications is Procore. It runs our primary construction operations, uh, document management and interaction with our subcontractors and owners. Um, so the, the main point today that I wanna talk about is a story we've got from our Salesforce days or actually pre-Salesforce that made us realize how important our data is. 
so it wasn't that long ago we were using Novell GroupWise. Um, people think that's a, a product of the late 90s, early 2000s, and it was, but we were still using it up until about 2016. And at the time we had um, just dipped our toe into, or we were just about, yeah, we just dipped our toe into Salesforce. And so we had our um, customers wanted, our employees wanted to synchronize contacts and calendar items, things like that with Salesforce. So we put in an integration tool that made those two systems talk together. And one of our business development managers synchronized their contacts into Salesforce. And we don't know if it was Salesforce or GroupWise, but one of the two took it upon itself to fill in birthdays that were missing on these contacts as January 1st, 1970, kind of the start of computer time. And Salesforce then thought, I'll be smart. I'll go ahead and create events for all those birthdays as well. So my boss and I were looking at some things um, in Salesforce and just checking things out after the integration was was had been running for a little while and realized that these events were all junk data. Salesforce was really great and allowed us to delete hundreds or maybe even thousands, I'm not sure, of these events in just a couple of clicks. So it was really fast. Within about five minutes, my boss's mailbox was popping notifications of people that were out of the office that seemed a little odd. She hadn't emailed them that day, so we didn't really know what was going on there. Then her phone rang, and she started getting calls saying um, that they were getting notifications from us that we had canceled their birthdays. Uh, one of her counterparts at another construction company actually called and said, hey, did you kind of joke, did you cancel my birthday party? It's actually tonight because today is my birthday. So that kind of stressed how important our data is. Uh, no matter where it was resides, we had always kind of thought about that of our unstructured file server data, email, SQL, things like that. We hadn't really thought about data that we're putting in the cloud and the importance of that. So when we started moving to Office 365 from on-prem group-wise, employees were pushing hard for synchronization tools between Outlook and Salesforce, but we didn't want to have a repeat of that experience without a backup plan in place for how we would how we would take care of that data if somebody were to do something bad to it, delete it, needed to do a recovery, that sort of thing. So we started looking at um, solutions with Salesforce that would be able to do data protection like any SaaS solution and IT managers at, at that time, I just kind of assumed that the SaaS providers had our had backups in place that would be able to help me with that. So I started looking and a Knowledge Base article came right up, and after reading it, I am pretty sure I either lost sleep or didn't sleep that night. Um, like anybody else in with SaaS applications, Salesforce data protection strategy is great for failover, losing an entire data center, um, kind of those massive losses. But when it comes to an employee business development, somebody doing something bad with a few or a few thousand records, it it was not going to work for us. So uh, just a couple of high points of the article, it, it talks about how it's a $10,000 to do a recovery. And they tell us it's, you know, don't worry about it. We're not, we're not uh, dinging you really bad for that. It costs us, it costs them a lot more to do that, but they're just sharing the cost with us. So don't worry about it. 10,000 is a bargain. You can only go back 90 days and it's a very manual process that takes six to eight weeks to do your data recovery. And they anticipated the first question out of everybody's mind and immediately said, no, there's no expedite process available. So you can't pay to get to the front of the line or go quicker. So this uh, restore that they give you is not really giving you complete restored data. They just give you a CSV file that contains your data and then give you access to a tool that will allow you to import that. Um, they tell you if you're not comfortable with that, grab a third party. Um, I think they even mentioned in there too that maybe it'd be a good idea to have a third-party backup product involved to make a process simpler, but I think that would probably need to be there before the disaster occurred. So not a great situation you could find yourself in when you're needing that article. So this put me on a search for uh, backup tools. Um, looking through the marketplace they had, we, we saw quite a few that were out there. Um, but we were a little different than most companies using Salesforce at the time. They had a brand new platform that we were using called Salesforce Communities. And we were using that for our intranet. Um, seemed like a great idea at the time. We've since moved to SharePoint. So 
um, take that for what you will, but instead of, a, you know, 120 business development, marketing, senior project management staff that we're using this is at a CRM, we had 700 employees. So every single employee in the company was using this system to access policies, procedures, standards, um, kind of all that intranet information. And all of these backup systems considered those as users of the system. It didn't matter their role that they couldn't uh, update or, or manage data in the system. All they were doing was reading documents, but that didn't matter to the backup providers. So they were gonna charge us per user per month on all of those. So when I, when I started reading about how the licensing worked on all, all those, I realized that was not gonna be the path for us. It wasn't gonna be a, another SaaS solution that we click go on and get it up and running. So we decided to give uh, Eagle a call. So like I said, we've been longtime partner with Eagle and Commvault, and I figured they had to have something going there. Um, so Eagle did a little digging on their end because they hadn't heard anything yet. And turns out that Commvault was about to go public with some beta um, data protection for Commvault or for Salesforce at the time. So we had some conversations about that. And actually the first Commvault Go was in Orlando. And at that event, I got to sit down with some of the product managers and even some of the developers and talk about our needs for backing up Salesforce and what our, what our requirements were, why we thought we were a little bit different than, than the average customer. And um, they realized that we'd be a pretty good fit to try it out for them. So about a month later, the code came out, it was beta, um, but was in one of the service packs. And so we hooked it up to our Salesforce sandbox. Um, so we weren't messing with our production data, but we, connected it, we had had the developers on the phone, had our SQL admin on the phone, everybody was just working together there and in under an hour, we had fully connected it, deleted records from the database, from Salesforce, restored them, pushed them back into the cloud, everything was working great. Um, did three to 5,000 records every time, it was no problem and it just took minutes to get everything back where it should be. Uh, the other big benefit of having that is the the way it works where you download all the data to a file server, stage it to SQL on premise, gave us some flexibility to use local BI tools to report on that data, which um, Salesforce's reporting tools are, are not what our, our BI people are used to, but it's also less expensive if we can use our own tools and, and change our licensing with Salesforce. So we, one of, the, one of the ways that we helped Commvault and they helped us in this is they had yet to see somebody using the Salesforce communities platform. So we were running some record types they hadn't run into yet. And before they went into production the next quarter, we were able to get some of those issues pre-resolved. Um, so those record types were recognized, but they also ended up finding some data in our, in our database that didn't match the data val validation rules. Um, we had migrated from sales logics and apparently our migration had just shoveled data. It didn't really matter. Um, so there's a field that needed to say, you know, $40 million in regular currency notation in it. Somebody had written it in as $40M. Um, didn't really match up. And we'd been running for years like that. And Salesforce had never caught it or given us any kind of indication. But when uh, Commvault went to back it up, they were able to notice that and help us get some of that stuff cleaned up. Um, so as soon as we, as soon as we got things up and running, um, they went into production the next quarter and we stood up a new, stood up a new VM. We didn't want to migrate from test to production, but we went into the, uh, we built a new VM for production. It only took us about an hour again to get that up and running. So everything went, went really well there. We actually had our file server that was running the system went kind of belly up the probably a year or two later. And when that happened, we had been meaning to rebuild that for other licensing reasons on the, on the kernel Linux reasons. So we went ahead and, and rebuilt that. And on the Commvault changes, I think it was about five minutes of repointing to a new IP address in the sales, Salesforce cloud agents. Um, so it was extremely easy to modify after the fact. So now today we back up Salesforce about four times a day. Um, I think it's about every every four or five hours we we run a backup there, and it deduplicates about ninety three percent. So it's extremely small, very quick, 
you barely even see it running uh, before it before it's done and restores are are just as easy as we as we would hope so let me this next slide i i always hear the title of uh, what's next in the voice of if you're a west wing fan president bartlett was notorious for saying what's next when he was done with something so um next for us we so like i mentioned we moved from salesforce communities to sharepoint so Commvault does obviously protect sharepoint data and all the the security and roles and stuff in there so we're, we're working on getting that implemented as well we've got a couple more uh, pokers in the fire with Commvault and Eagle right now we're working through uh, Commvault activate deployment which we we retain our emails in 365 for 20 years um, our retention policy is set at 20 years by ourselves not for a, a requirement or anything by the government but We've got some states where we build buildings that they can have a 15 year warranty on the building. So it could be 15 years later that somebody comes along and says, hey, all these windows on the west side are now leaking. And we need to be able to go back and rebuild what happened when the, when that was all installed to see, you know, was it, a, was it a defect in the materials? Was it an installation issue? Was bad instruction given from one person to another? And email has always helped us in that. So. Long retention on email, lots of claims and e-discovery requests that we end up going through. Uh, Activate's kind of exciting because it will help us pull all of our data into a single platform for those searches. So we've got an e-discovery platform today that just does email. Once we get Activate fully running, we'll be able to do email, file servers, cloud data, all of that in one place. Um, along with, the, with that purchase, we, we were able to, to shoehorn in the um, endpoint protection. So we're going to start on the on the cloud protection of our laptops, like um, like Don mentioned here. And so we're gonna do the backup of all of our laptops around the world. And then just keep an eye on all the other ways that Commvault can help us in the cloud applications as we, as we start to roll them out. So as our IT staff likes to remind me and others in our company pretty frequently, um, putting your data in the cloud is just putting it on someone else's server. So it's it's definitely something that you need to keep your own best interests in mind when it, when it comes to putting that data out there.